Yes. Okay. Uh, some good news. Uh, Cisco shares jumped three percent. They beat their earnings expert expectations. Roku killed it with new users and revenue in the fourth quarter. An eight percent surge in morning trade, and finally Twilio soared twelve percent in morning trading. Okay, Roku. Why Roku? I think Roku is still a very relevant company. People are still streaming a ton of content. But again, look at Roku about a year, a year and a half ago. It was much, much higher. I think we're seeing a bit of a bounce back in some of these companies. I would say that their stock value during the lockdown was overvalued. But maybe, maybe, and I hate to admit that a stock could ever be undervalued, <laughs> but maybe the market overcorrected and sent a lot of these I think, stocks. I think, the I, they think they, I think they felt this widespread thing that the virtual era is over, everybody's going back into the world, and we're not. We're creating this sort of hybrid existence now where you want to stay in and watch something on Roku, you want to go to the movie theater. Do you want to go out for dinner or just have it brought? I mean, it it, it, we be, our lives have become much more complex that way. Right. And, yeah. I think hybrid is the perfect word to use because Roku didn't go away. People are still streaming. Twilio didn't go away. Uh, businesses are still using their software. Yeah. Um, and the, that whole, the digital world is changing and becoming one way or another. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Friday, February 17th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncensored look at life and business in the Valley. My name is Mike Malone. And I'm here with special contributor Scott Budman, who you all know by now, technology reporter for NBC Bay Area. Our producer is Jordan Henderson. Our East Coast correspondent is Bob Grove. And our host, as always, is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Okay, I want to get into some fin financial stuff quickly to get that out of the way before we get into the meat of the stuff today. Okay. The Dow Jones fell 400 points Thursday and then came back up to minus 200 points. But it seems to be based on some strange things like apparently the economy is doing pretty good and unemployment claims are down a little bit. And that suggests that there's another fear of return of inflation so the market backed off on what we would, normal people would think of as good news. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that does sound right. You know, a strong economy means a lot of jobs are being created. Uh, but when a lot of jobs are being created, we often see inflation. And we still see the core CPI coming in with prices that have not gone down as far as the Fed wants with all of its interest rate cuts. So prices are still high. Employment is still high, despite the tech layoffs. And on a day after we learned that, I think the stock market fell. It fell about 430 points on Thursday because investors expect the interest rate hikes to continue. And, you know, that hurts companies' bottom lines. They're talking 50 points, maybe, on the next round from the Fed. Who knows? It's interesting that I would argue that it's not so much these interest rate hikes that have curbed inflation. Inflation is still there. It's just not jumping as high as it was. My guess is we're seeing a dip, especially out here on the West Coast in gas prices, uh, you know, which was caused by the, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, but also people just seem willing to still buy groceries and things. And so it's not really cutting in all that much to companies' bottom lines. And so they're thinking, well, maybe we can get away with that, you know, little bit of a, a rise in price. Um, which happens when you have a lot of jobs and job creation, which we still have. So it's almost like the Fed and the economy are battling each other, and I, I don't really know who wins. Yeah, uh, just to add to it, the uh, January's producer price index from the Labor Department rose 0.7% for the month, and the estimate was 0.4%. So that doesn't augur well either. Well, again, it means uh, things are still humming along in the economy. And, you know, remember the last time we faced high inflation. I mean, you have to go back to, I think, the Ronald Reagan days. And they really, the Fed really had to slow the economy in order to curb inflation. The yep. Fed is trying to put the brakes on our economy, but we're still humming along. Shoppers are still shopping. And for the most part, uh, people are still working. 
and making money. Okay, now there's some weird contrary numbers out there. Shopify plunged 16% uh, their stock because of their 23 revenue outlook fell quite short of expectations. So, okay, people are going out to stores to shop. They're not doing it online. But meanwhile, DoorDash came in with incredible numbers. So do people are people going to the store to, to buy stuff and then going home and ordering food for <laughs> delivery? I mean, what's going on here? I mean, I think a little bit of both. I think in terms of Spotify, excuse me, let's let's tackle DoorDash first. Yeah. DoorDash went public during the pandemic, and it was a company built for the pandemic. Oh, and yeah. its stock price went up to above $200, and everyone was thinking, this is our future. Then people started going to restaurants again, and DoorDash stock price went down to about $50 a share. Um, and I think both of those prices were stampedes. It yeah. was too high and then it was too low. DoorDash now has lowered expectations. And guess what? People are still using it a lot. Not just because we got used to it, because it's so convenient. And I think just like Amazon, people are in that realm now. This is our world. We're going to use DoorDash. So the numbers come in better than expected. The stock goes up to well, 70, 75, still much lower than during the uh, lockdown. But right. you know, just when you thought, oh, food delivery is a thing of the past. DoorDash says, no, we still got a pretty decent valuation and we're still doing better than expected. Uh, because like you said, we may be shopping, but we're also ordering in. Yeah, and I can always tell DoorDash in my neighborhood because it's the car that parks at a 45 degree angle to the curb <laughs> as somebody leaps out with a bag in their hand or they're on the wrong side of the street parked running into a house. Right. And think about what Shopify does, the other company you brought up, you know, software to enable online shopping. And again, much like Amazon, and for that matter, even Netflix, it zoomed during the pandemic and the lockdown. I mean, much higher. And then, oh, they had to let some people go. They saw their stock value come back down. And again, it's not that any of these companies are completely done and irrelevant, but they're just not 100% of our focus. Um, and so we're sort of living in two worlds now, the real world and the online world at the same time. Yes. Okay. Uh, some good news. Uh, Cisco shares jumped 3%. They beat their earnings expectations. Roku killed it with new users and revenue in the fourth quarter, an 8% surge in morning trade. And finally, Twilio soared 12% in morning trading. Okay. Roku? Why Roku? I think Roku is still a very relevant company. People are still streaming a ton of content. But again, look at Roku about a year, a year and a half ago. It was much, much higher. I think we're seeing a bit of a bounce back in some of these companies. I would say that their stock value during the lockdown was overvalued. But maybe, maybe, and I hate to admit that a stock could ever be undervalued, <laughs> but maybe the market overcorrected and sent a lot of these stocks. I think they felt this widespread thing that the virtual era is over, everybody's going back into the world, and we're not. We're creating this sort of hybrid existence now where you want to stay in and watch something on Roku, you want to go to the movie theater. Do you want to go out for dinner or just have it brought? I mean, it it, it, we be, our lives have become much more complex that way. Right. And, yeah. I think hybrid is the perfect word to use because Roku didn't go away. People are still streaming. Twilio didn't go away. Uh, businesses are still using their software. Yeah. Um, and the, that whole, the digital world is changing and becoming one way or another. I would say it's not true. I'd say we're living in a hybrid world where you can do both. And that's good for competition. It's good for consumers. But these companies still have to figure out what their valuations are in a hybrid world. They got to find their footing. Exactly. Yes. Find their level. Okay. Well, we got to get into this. Did you get a notice from Tesla recently? <laughs> so this was big news Thursday. Um, I do not have any self-driving software uh, in, in my EV. Um, neither of us do. And at this point, that's good news. I don't want to say I saw this day coming, but... I cover this stuff for a living. So I was like, nope, I'm not going to pay extra for the yeah. self-driving stuff. Um, and sure, indeed, Tesla has recalled, what, 420,000 cars or something. Yeah, it started at 363, sure. but I think it's grown since then. Yeah. Thank you, 360,000. Um, 
And this is an admission that some of this stuff is dangerous. It is likely to be an over the air uh, fix from what I am told. But again, uh, you know, look at the Super Bowl ad that ran on this. I think it ran in this market, um, you know, criticizing Tesla's full self-driving software, saying it's too early. Um, and it's just, this product is out there as a technology that I don't think is 100% ready. Will anything be 100% ready? I don't know. But not, not in dealing with not going from the digital world to the natural world. Yeah. You can never fully, digital can never fully capture, it can approximate, but it can't fully, you know, capture analog reality. Yeah. I mean, one of the concerns I've always had with self driving cars with autonomous vehicles is not just the vehicle itself and its technology, but the fact that it's out in the real world, which is just not yet ready for full self-driving technology. And so there's still this clash, and that's why we get these accidents that make headlines. Yeah, go on like Fail Army sometime on the web and watch a guy sitting at a stoplight, and he looks over and a tree's about to fall on him, and he punches it, and the tree falls behind him. Now, if you're sitting in your Tesla, you're going to be hitting that foot pedal as hard as you can, and it's going to not let you go through that intersection because it doesn't see that tree you well know? i think you can take over remember they say yeah. even with full self driving over. you should have your you know you shouldn't be sleeping you shouldn't be on your phone or in the back seat you should have your hands on the wheel uh but right it's it's the rest of the world it's the falling trees it's the lines in the road it's the stop signs and the stop lights and all of these things that software has to detect and if there's one theme i think right now where we stand in this very point in the world it's how the real world and software are kind of meeting and kind of getting to know each other, whether it's yeah. full self-driving and, you know, the roadways or AI versus real writing. We're just still getting to know each other. And one is not ready to take over from the other, I don't think, just yet. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you read about the metaverse, you read about the inter you know, uh, Internet of Things, and you're going, OK, but it works on paper. It works in simulations, but the world is so unpredictable. You know, do, will a Tesla see a tornado? <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, so anyway, they've recalled a whole of four hundred thousand vehicles, and um, according to the National Traffic Safety Administration, uh, the autonomous driving software it led to an unreasonable risk to motor vehicle safety based on insufficient adherence to traffic safety laws which apparently has to do with yellow lights it has trouble dealing with yellow lights right and yellow lights as we know are part of the real world that we see yeah. sometimes dozens of times a day and so if we're going to be in a car that can't quite negotiate a yellow light something has to change and it, this is just not i don't think 100% ready for the real world yet. Maybe they'll have a teenage mode and a grown-up mode. So the teenage mode has to stop when the light turns yellow. And if you're an adult, you can punch it. There's enough time. You know, it's only pink. <laughs> so I don't know. It doesn't seem to me this thing is going to get resolved real quickly. Maybe not in our lifetimes. Uh, okay. Meanwhile, uh, did you read this about Elon Musk? how he marshaled the troops at Twitter because pre apparently President Biden tweeted something during the Super Bowl and he has uh, 37 million followers and it generated 29 million impressions. At the yes. same time, Elon, who has 128 million followers, also tweeted and he only generated 9.1 million impressions. And so he, using his cousin, I guess, uh, James Musk, mobilized using sl uh, Slack at 2.30 in the morning, the following mor uh, morning, all employees to uh, make dashboards and write software, please, because so you can help this solve this problem. The problem being Elon didn't get more hits than the president of the United States. Uh, you know, so much for this sort of, open platform, free speech, everybody's equal. Apparently in Elon's world, some people are more equal than others and some people deserve to be much more equal than everybody else.
yeah, this was a crazy story. And apparently, if you believe Platformer, which is an excellent source of journalism, they do say someone actually got fired for pointing out that fact that, hey, you're just not getting the, you know, the hits that the president is. But it really also says something about Elon Musk that's been ongoing for a long time is his need for the spotlight, his need to stir things up. Uh, Mike, when you said, did you read that thing about Elon Musk and you paused, I was going to say, you've got to be a lot more specific before we continue this conversation. <laughs> yeah. And, and in a weekly podcast, how often do you have to say that about somebody? I mean, uh, you know, maybe if you'd said, hey, what about that spy balloon? OK, be a little more specific. But really, with Musk, you just have to narrow it down because he's always stirring things up. And I don't know how this affects the average daily Twitter user other than as soon as this thing happened, people said in the for you section, which is one of the choices, um, Musk popped up in just about every feed all the time. And, you know, that's just not how many of us want to see Twitter. Uh, and I think they did dial it back. But that's a person who's letting his personal insecurities yeah. get in the way of running a company. And that's not good. It's also a person who seems to be going from being a CEO to an autocrat. And the next step is, is tyrant. So we got to monitor this. I'm yeah, worried. I mean, a lot of people are waiting for him to make good on his promise to step down as CEO, and he hasn't done that yet. Yeah, he says he's going to do it this year. Yeah, we'll see. Three and a half months left. Yeah. <laughs> okay, more, one more Twitter. Uh, sorry, Tesla. You know, the, the, the Musk empire. Uh, Tesla workers in the company's Buffalo, New York autopilot facility we're back to that again, has sent a letter to uh, CEO Elon Musk stating they stating their intention to unionize. And now organizers at that location are accusing the company of illegally terminating employees in retaliation. You know, that's something that, you know, has to go in front of the NLRB and all that. But that's the kind of image being a being a union buster that uh, doesn't help especially when you consider most of Twitter's users are pretty liberal people. And the idea of a big corporate corporation run by this tyrannical leader, which he sees be turning into firing employees for union organizing against the law is uh, that's bad PR. No, yeah, no this, other is something, this is something we've seen this battle now in a number of tech companies and this is where Tesla does get kind of interesting because although it sees itself, and I think Tesla investors see it as a tech company, the fact is it's an automaker and automakers tend to be unionized. And I don't know how Musk or Tesla gets out of this given that they make cars. And you can call yourself a tech company all you want, but if you are on the assembly line making cars, yeah. um, a lot of those jobs are union jobs. And I, I don't know how he gets out of this. Yeah, and you know, technology, technology industry, and especially Silicon Valley has gone fifty years without unionization. I mean, they've let it they've let it happen on the corners, like, oh, the janitors want to, you know, join up or something like that. But at the center of Silicon Valley companies, there haven't been unions all this time. So when they see union union organizing activity, they're they're just like shocked they never they have no precedent for it most of them have no experience in it because they're white collar their dad wasn't in a union and they tend to react kind of out of hand and heavy handedly because they don't know any other way they consider it a an assault on the company right i mean heavy handedly maybe illegally but we have seen unions start to catch on it's interesting i mean I, you know, it's been many generations since unions really had power in American industry and they're starting to catch on. Young people are saying, hey, enough. Part of it is what they want. Part of it is what they went through during the pandemic. And, you know, you say the fringes, but even, you know, Amazon's got a union now that they're dealing with. Starbucks, a gigantic company, has many of its stores unionizing. And we're just starting to see it come down the line. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of it and these laws get tested. And by the way, given what the SEC and FTC are starting to do, trying to show that they have teeth and coming down on these hearings, excuse me, these companies, dragging them to hearings, you know, saying, hey, you can't buy this other company. In other words, just showing some strength. I wonder if that will come into play as young people in these companies 
are trying to unionize at the same time. Yeah. Well, you think code writers would ever organize? I don't know. It really depends. Um, you can get away with saying, hey, you don't need a union. We have salaries and stock options, benefits and nice campuses up to a certain point. Yeah. But eventually people get used to that or bored with that or don't get that anymore. And, you know, if you get hired today by Amazon, are those stock options really that exciting to you? Maybe you yeah. want a guarantee and maybe you want a union. Who knows? But I, I think- yeah, If people... I'm in a warehouse peeing in a bottle because I, oh, right. I don't get a bathroom break, unions look pretty nice. I agree. I agree. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think if it's going to happen, it's going to be happening right about now with all these laid off you know, young people all over the valley. I mean, you're walking out, you you were promised that you were among the Illuminati, you know, working for Google, you're the best and brightest in America. And now you're in the parking lot with a cardboard box with all your stuff in it. Uh, you might be just a little bit resentful. It depends. I think if people are still going the startup route, um, yeah. you know, they will say, hey, who needs a union? Who needs a whole salary, a whole bunch of benefits? I've got this potential gold pot of gold up the other side of the rainbow but who's really been hiring up until recently the big companies that are already established their stock prices are mature and maybe if you're being asked to work 60 70 hour weeks you want something to back you up you want a union and i wouldn't be surprised if even on the software side not to mention the hardware side um labor starts to ask for more union representation and we haven't seen that in a long time and thanks to FASB and all, all the other accounting operations, companies can't give you the stock they used to give you. Right. You know, it, I mean, when Apple went public, it supposedly had created 100 millionaires just among the secretaries and the staffers and the administrative assistants and all that. You're not going to see that anymore. I mean, those days are kind of behind us, I'm afraid to say. I mean... It depends. Uh, we have still seen a lot of wealth created through stock options sure. and IPOs. I mean, look at Zoom just a few years ago. And, you know, if you cashed out on time, you made a ton of money. Uh, but right now we're in a down cycle for IPOs. Your stock isn't worth much. Even if you hold options at a big company, you might have seen those options cut in half when it comes to value. And you're thinking, ooh, am I protected from working all these hours and being you know, ask getting Slack memos at 2.30 from Elon Musk in the morning or, you know, perhaps getting laid off. And and that's what makes a union attractive to people is a sense of security as opposed to that, hey, let's just go full guns out and, and get our stock options and try to build this company. We'll see which side wins. Yeah, it's like, well, maybe I won't get that, be able to get that Ferrari, but I sure would like to be able to meet all my payments on a nice new Ford. Yes, exactly. You know, guaranteed job. Okay. Um, YouTube. Uh, Susan Wojcicki, uh, the longtime CEO of YouTube, is stepping down after many years. I mean, people don't realize it, but she was in the garage, you know, with with the with the two with Paige and uh, uh, Bryn. I mean, she goes all the way back to the first day. And for her to leave, is that a sign? I mean, when you see people that are so critical to a company, have been involved so long, carry the intellectual capital of that company, and you know the uh, the cookbook. When they leave, are they leaving because of what they say, or are they leaving because they see the glory days are over? That's a great question. And with her, you talk about the early days. We're not talking about the early days of YouTube. We're talking about the earliest days of Google. Yeah. Way before they even bought YouTube. I mean, she's an OG in this valley. And the idea I remember thinking when she took over YouTube was, woo, that is uh, got to be the toughest job right now. Google takes care of itself. YouTube yeah. was growing like a rocket, had all these controversies over patents and, you know, copyrights, not to mention all the online abuse and, and all that. And she handled it, I think, extremely well. And I really wonder where YouTube, as a, a, its own standalone entity worth billions of dollars, goes from, you know, maybe even hundreds of billions, goes from here. Do they spin it off? Is that part of what's going on? Or do they just try to get someone else in charge who maybe doesn't quite understand the culture? Again, not only of YouTube, but of Google, that she did. And uh, she's one of the really, I think, most important leaders in Silicon Valley um, because of the job she had. 
And that leaves a lot of question marks because YouTube has become super important and super controversial. Uh, it's given facing, facing challenges it's never faced before. I mean, maybe she's just exhausted from the TikTok fight. Maybe. And, and again, she's been at Google since the beginning. So think about all the years she's put in um, and then leading this company and, of course, amassing a great deal of wealth. She can do whatever she wants. And who knows if it was just time or if this signals some sort of a move. And, you know, again, I think a lot of regulators are going to be on Google, on Alphabet to spin off YouTube, just like we've seen the Elizabeth Warrens and the FTCs of the world saying, break up Facebook, you know, break up Meta. Uh, and, and so it's going to be an interesting year going forward, knowing that they're going to have new leadership and who knows, maybe even a new direction. Do you think if there was something really cool in the works at Google, she would have jumped to that just for the next big challenge instead of presiding over this aging operation? I mean, something was coming out of Google X, you know, some really exciting new technology or new market or something. People like her, they don't need the money, but they do, they jones for the excitement. You know? right. And I, I wouldn't be surprised. I think even in the memo that uh, Sundar Pichai put out, that Alphabet put out saying she's still going to be in the company. And yeah, maybe maybe she wants to do something else. Uh, she certainly put in a lot of time at YouTube and steered that ship through some crazy waters. Uh, and you're right, money isn't important. So maybe it's time to do something else. Uh, and that's not all that uncommon in Silicon Valley to say, okay, I've gotten from point A all the way to point, you know, whatever. And now it's time to, to do something else to just keep the creative juices flowing. Uh, so, so that may be a possibility as well. I, I think we need to keep an eye on her because we've been talking about how the Valley needs the next big thing uh, that's, you know, fires it up again, creates trillion dollar new market and all that. If we see her moving to some place inside of Google and we start seeing other interesting people migrating towards her, that may be a, the very first sign of something big in the works. Right, because what did she do last time? She took over and grew to extreme heights. One of the recent hot things, which was you know sort of this mix of streaming media and social networks that YouTube has become. So yeah, I'd absolutely say watch her. And uh, you know, hey, right I now Alphabet needs help. Yeah, and in the business world, that's the biggest high there is. Right. Is to get, get on a comet from the start and ride it all the way through. Okay. Um, one last thing. Uh, we now know who the wealthy backers were of uh, indicted FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried. Remember, he got that two hundred fifty million million dollar bail bond. Um, okay, so this is kind of interesting. Former Stanford Law School Dean Larry Kramer and Stanford University research scientist Andreas uh, Pepke uh, helped him to go home to, to Palo Alto. Uh, that's kind of wild. Uh, Kramer pledged pro property worth half a million dollars, and Pepke pledged property worth $200,000. Uh, what do you think? W what's that all about? I mean, Taking care look, of a this, former student? Right. Look, this is pretty incestuous here at Stanford. I mean, law professors putting up 